a continuing education consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development. And uh, our statewide campaign this year is called Florida Libraries As, and we're working to ensure Florida libraries are recognized as fulfilling many vital roles in their communities. Whether utilized as a community memory repository, a resource for workforce recovery, or social service referral, a publisher or gallery, Florida's libraries provide a vast array of services beyond lending books. This month's theme is Florida Libraries as Small Business Incubators. We have two more webinars coming up this month that center around the theme of Florida Libraries as Small Business Incubators, too. First, on April 15th at noon, we will have Emily Majeski present on Florida Libraries as Small Business Incubators using Gale Florida Electronic Library resources. So reward yourself on this year's IRS filing deadline by learning about how to harness Florida Electronic Library resources for the future of your library's role in your local economy. Our final Libraries as Small Business Incubators webinar on April 23rd will again feature Emily Majeski of Gale Cengage, with whom we'll explore demographics now and learn to use this tool to gain knowledge of communities of customers and make effective business decisions. <clears throat> Through these webinars, you get to hear from us about libraries as small business incubators, but we would be delighted to hear how you all are leveraging library services to promote small businesses. Check out our website to see stories from libraries across Florida who shared their stories of about libraries as community memory. Bay County Public Library is one great example. Share yours by visiting the What's Your Story page on our website. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Jill Canono, our library leadership consultant. Jill. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for attending today. We're really excited about Florida Libraries as Small Business Incubators. I do want to acknowledge Laura Dole, who is on this call today. She sent in one of the stories from um, her library, and we were able to post that on our website. So if you're doing exciting things, please go ahead and send that information to me, and uh, we'll share it on our website so other people will have access to it. I'm really excited as well to um, have with us to J uh, John Hagen, our presenter today. We actually became aware of John when he presented at the TBLC um, annual meeting last year, and so we contacted him and Nancy Fredericks, who he had been working with, to see if he'd come and share his knowledge with us via a webinar. So at this point in time, I'd like to introduce to you John. Um, he's the president and CEO of the Pasco County Economic Development Council. John has a long career in economic development, urban and regional planning, marketing, and public relations, spanning more than 30 years in four states. John holds a master's degree in public administration from Western Michigan University alumnus of the Seidman Business uh, Graduate School of Business at Grand Valley State University. He also holds a master's degree from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan. Go Wolverines! Um, he has earned the professional cert uh, certification of the International Economic Development Council and he's a native of Michigan. John and his wife Joy have been married for 38 years. They have two sons, Peter and Andrew, who live in the Midwest. Um, I think Nancy will be joining us later to share some information, but at this point in time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John. Welcome. Well, great. It's, uh, I appreciate that introduction. Hopefully you can hear me and I'm all connected. So um, I, would, I do have some slides, and I'd uh, love to uh, tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. So um, what you see is kind of in, on the first slide is uh, sort of one of our iconic children that we've been using to promote the idea that Pasco County is uh, filled with all kinds of uh, crazy people that love to invent things and to uh, become entrepreneurs, and even our kids are uh, trying to soar, basically, is the idea. So next slide. So just a little bit about us. We're, we've been around for actually for a long time. We're a 28-year-old nonprofit, and most of what we do has been involved with what I would call traditional economic development, trying to recruit businesses from other places around the country or trying to get our own companies to expand. And you see there kind of our track record since 95, uh, 96, we started keeping track of it this way. But really what happened to us is in 2008, our world, like most people's world, really changed. And we had to start thinking differently. And so we kind of 
got into a uh, different thought process that I just want to kind of humorously tell you about in the next couple slides. So next slide. So one of the things that we sort of picked up on was the, to illustrate the point that there's, is that the world is kind of, you can always divide it up into two groups of people. So we, as an example, we have Coke drinkers and Pepsi drinkers. Next slide. We have dog lovers and cat lovers. Next slide. We have iPhone users and Android users. Next slide. And then if you take a little deeper dive, we have people who accept fate, as an example. Next slide. But then we also have people who tempt fate. Next slide. We have people who play by the rules. Next slide. And then my favorite, Lady Gaga. We have people that make their own rules. Next slide. Then we have people who own things. This is Richard Branson. Next slide. And then we have people who work for people who own things. Next slide. So as we started thinking about economic development and just the role of public education in, in our workforce, you know, what we re realize is that public education kind of teaches people how to be a good citizen, a good, good student, good worker. In other words, next slide. People who accept fate, play by the rules, and work for people who own things. Next slide. But if you look at prosperity, which is sort of a fountainhead for job creation and economic development, it really kind of comes from these people who are sort of the opposite of that. They're people who constantly tempt fate, make their own rules, and ultimately people who own things. Next slide. So the question that we kind of tried to figure out was, well, so how do we unleash these people and where do they learn this stuff? How can we create more of these kinds of people so that they will create jobs in our community and put the other kind of people to work for them? And so, you know, we couldn't find out where they're really being trained. It just seemed like they're learning it through experience or maybe it's even sort of a genetic component that they just sort of have to do this, this kind of uh, job creation or, or to put it in their terms, you know, entrepreneurship. And it kind of, so it kind of gets you into the nature versus nurture thing, which is not the point of this, but, you know, we're trying to figure out how, how this actually works and how we can take advantage of it. So next slide. <clears throat> so the, the irony of it is you look at Albert Einstein, who arguably is the smart, smartest girl, guy in the whole world, and, um, you know, he says the, the only source of knowledge is experience. So... It's, I find that kind of ironic coming from somebody who apparently had a great set of genes. Next slide. And so, you know, it leads you to the thought here that, well, if it is kind of genetic, then these people are distributed across the population, and, and in other words, they're everywhere. And the problem is that some of them never really realize their potential, which, of course, we would like to see happen. And then some of it kind of realize it in destructive or antisocial ways. And, so I just as an example, I, I saw a documentary here not too long ago called Cocaine Cowboys. It was filled with um, all kinds of really interesting, you know, bizarre people really who had built m major crime empires around the, the cocaine industry. And you realize, wow, they're actually really ingenious in, in a sort of a devious way. And if they would just have applied that to something that's actually socially constructive, um, they might have become, you know, the next Bill Gates or, or, you know, however we might want to characterize it. So you kind of, you realize these people are around is the point. And so if we can get them to, to uh, um, kind of optimize their potential, but to do it in, in ways that are not antisocial or destructive and they can, and that they actually do optimize it, then, um, you know, that would, could lead us in some uh, really great, places. So the question is, well, how do we create a system that does that? So that's where we kind of started in 2008. Next slide. So, you know, so how, what if we could teach, a, teach people to do this and then kind of support them in their, in their efforts and connect them with other like-minded individuals? So that was the thought process. Next slide. And in, in effect, kind of create a, an ecosystem. And so what would it look like? Well, at, on one hand, it would kind of in, involve technical assistance and startup funding and space is sort of what you might think of as classical incubation, and, but also support groups to try and uh, help these uh, entrepreneurs get started and to start their own businesses. Next slide. 
but it would also be really helpful if you could create a culture that sort of celebrates that. So it's more than just creating a space and some counselors. You really need to create these other opportunities where people are encouraged to do this and where experimenting becomes a, kind of a way of life and people are not afraid to fail. And in fact, maybe failure is even celebrated as just uh, another step on the way to uh, success. And so, again, we saw that trying to get people kind of working bottom up would be a big part of an ideal system. Next slide. And then we also realized, well, gee, what if the education system could get harnessed, the formal education system? So we might want to start down in third grade with more hands-on education about innovation and entrepreneurship and, and problem solving, not, not to mention you know, technical things like uh, STEM. In sixth, sixth grade, we might want to expose kids to more of the world of work. And then in ninth grade, we might actually want to create entrepreneurship academies where instead of learning how to be a healthcare worker, let's say, you might think about starting a healthcare company or inventing a healthcare application of some type. And then post-secondary, um, we might want to set up situations where there's co-oping and mentoring so that people can continue their education for the rest of their lives in this direction. Next slide. And then finally, to really make this work kind of at a community level or county level or even state level, it seems like you would want to create what might be called a collective impact model where you can harness business education, government, and social services towards a common vision, a sort of point on the horizon where we were identifying and getting people who had this itch to become entrepreneurs and owners to learn about it and then act on it and start companies and grow companies and grow an economy. And of course, part of that is also having, since you have distributed um, uh, decision making, part of it's also including, uh, you have to include some, um, some information systems so that you can, people can act on what's uh, going on in the real world and be more nimble about aligning uh, where they're going and, um, and how, how they're getting there. So of course that also argues or implies a level of collaboration and partnership. And then finally inclusion, because if we're really trying to find the needle in the haystack, well then you know, we, we need to in incorporate as many people as we can so that these people will come out of that haystack and identify themselves and, and then we can start to work with them. So the more hay we process in a way, the more needles we find. That's a, that's a strange uh, analogy, I realize. Next slide. <clears throat> So, you know, as we got into this, we kind of had um, an interesting thing that happened. We, we connected with our library just through serendipity. They, they asked us to, um, to uh, sign a uh, letter of support for a little project they were working on to, um, to uh, uh, run some seminars for small businesses. And so at the same time, we were trying to organize some of our small business resources to get people to collaborate and start down this path I just described. And as we did that, we, um, some interesting things started to happen, but one of the things that we realized is that libraries kind of have this unspoken role as crucibles of entrepreneurship, and they've been, I would say, largely unrecognized as economic development assets. And so in our organization, and we started talking to our librarians, uh, notably Nancy Fredericks here at Pasco County, about how we could kind of work together. And we saw that they were in this ecosystem, and I really hate that term because it's kind of a jargon term in economic development, but in the ecosystem we were trying to create, we are trying to align our community resources, we saw all of a sudden that they were an interesting and pretty critical node. And Another term I learned here recently is that, you know, we live in a VUCA world, which means, you know, volatility, uncertainty, chaos, and ambiguity. It's kind of a military term. And in a place where you have all of this turmoil going on that we see daily, and it seems to be getting worse in complexity, libraries kind of organize information, and they are kind of a, an anti-entropic force. So that alone makes them um, part of what we're, we want to try and organize as a community resource and collaborate with. Next slide. Hey, John, we've got somebody with their hand up. Jeff, um, I'm going to unmute you if you've got um, a question. Go ahead. 
Jeff? Yes, oh. Hello? Hello? Hi. Yeah, it, there's a question somebody had? Nope. Oh, sorry, no I question think, says. Okay. Carry on. Yeah, on. Yeah, you can stop me at any time, all right? So, okay. And so what happened is we started to work with the libraries. We created this thing called the PASCO Enterprise Network, and it was a virtual organization. We essentially got everybody working with small businesses, and, and you have these kind of people in your communities too. So, you know, it's the Small Business Development Center, the uh, SCORE chapter, you know, the retired business people, our community college, our organization, the Chambers of Commerce, and we included the libraries in this group. And we said, we're going to create a model where not one-stop shopping, but no wrong door, where if somebody comes into your door and they're trying to start a business or grow a business, you help them, you do everything you can for them, but you try to also reach out to them and say, well, are there other things that you need, because I can connect you with a network of other people. And so that by in that way, we kind of pass people around, so to speak. And so we've started to log all the people that, the business people that our members have helped and one of the things that was a real epiphany for us is that um, the library had, a, had seemed to account for about 60% of what we would call leads that come out of the PASCO Enterprise Network. So the last three years we had almost 1,000 leads and 60% of them came from the public library. Now, ironically, that's more than SCORE, SPDC, the EDC, Community College, the Workforce Board, and six chambers combined. And these are the people that are kind of supposed to be helping businesses. So, you know, it, it just illustrates the point that there's a lot going on in the libraries that have been unrecognized and was um, by, at least by the uh, economic development community. Now, there, there might also be a measurement error here because the libraries are really good about reporting, you know, the fact that people have been coming in to talk to them, and some of our other partners are, are less so. But I think it does really represent what's going on in reality, even though maybe it's not as precise as 573 out of 954. Um, and the, the leads, I see a question here, how did you track the origin of the leads? This is all self-reported by the, um, by the uh, members of the network. So they tell us how many people they saw this month as a, just a simple way to put it. And then, they, and then they, of course, if people need things from other members, they pass them into the network. So there may be some double counting, but again, I think the origin of the leads is pretty much right on target. So next slide. Um, so then you ask yourself, well, why are people going to the libraries? Because it's kind of a surprising result. And so you start to think about it, and you go, well, why, why would they? And so our, our, um, our uh, our premises are that, well, there's, you know, you have free information, you got free internet and computer access, you got a free desk, free meeting space, free reference assistance, free audiovisual equipment. So that would be very attractive if you're trying to start some and you typically don't have a lot of money as you get into it. Next slide. And then you also realize, well, gee, you have access to copiers, they have databases and subscriptions that you can uh, get to. There's workshops they put on. They have networking groups and, and roundtables in some cases. So, you know, it, it, you start to realize it's a very compelling place to go if you're trying to get started, especially on a shoestring. Next slide. So that's kind of led us into where we are now, which is the idea, well, can we use libraries in other ways? And can we start to work with them and harness more of the potential that is there either because of their expertise or the, the facilities they have, but also the, just the patrons because um, people go into libraries for various reasons. And so if you can start to tap that, um, you can actually bring together some other resources. So um, one of the things we have, and we have two incubators right now in Pasco County, and in them we have co-working spaces where people can go and they can kind of work together and and uh, they start to collaborate and then sort of magical things happen. It's kind of a pre-incubation type service if you want to think about it that way. And so, but libraries could also have co-working spaces and not, undoubtedly some of them do, but it could, could start to get enhanced. And then not only that, but you know, sometimes they run 
clubs and things like uh, one of our libraries has a French club. So we were thinking about um, reaching out to a um, kind of a lap sister city that we have here in the community. So we wrote up a letter to do that, and um, we happened to connect with a librarian. This is actually in Newport Ritchie, and she said, "Oh, well, we have the French Club. They can go translate it." So you start thinking, "Wow, you know, there's probably other people that are going into the library who are native speakers who may be able to help somebody with translation services." So if you're doing exporting or something and you're trying to get started and you don't want to go pay somebody, you might be able to just find a volunteer or somebody that could pay a few dollars and they could help you translate um, letters, sales letters or brochures or whatever it might be. And then in addition, we see that there are tools, you know, like um, people trying to do videography as an example. Our, our libraries have um, video tools, they have got software for editing. So you start to catalog the things that are available from the library, and there's actually kind of a, a rich kit that people could take advantage of, not just for leisure services, which is how probably a lot of people think of the library, but for actually creating businesses that might generate a considerable amount of value for uh, the community economy. So again, I've used research um, or reference librarians to do research for a number of years, and I think businesses don't really see that that is a possibility, but it is there. In an, in a form of, you could almost create a form of mini incubation by harnessing these library tools and, and getting people to realize they can go to the library to do these sorts of things. So next slide. And then I think beyond that, it's gotten me thinking about maybe even a, a larger, more visionary role. So in the, in the business community right now, there's an economic development community, there's a certain amount of discussion about um, the idea of creating collisions, of organizing your workspace so that people have to meet with each other or run into each other in informal ways. The idea being that if you put two smart, creative people in a room together, something will come of it that's good. And so spaces are being arranged to kind of force those interactions, and there's a certain amount of thought being given to that in the context of the workplace of the future. So libraries, in a way, are already collision spaces. They just don't necessarily think of themselves that way, or if they do, it's more in a social sense of, oh, it's a place where people can meet and you know, kind of develop a sense of community in the, just in the general sense of the word. And then beyond that, it kind of leads you to this thought process about open source problem solving, and there's been a number of experiments going on with that in the business community in a virtual sense. But, you know, suppose that you could use libraries as a way of helping to organize communities in doing open source problem solving to solve community issues on an ongoing basis. And I think that that would be pretty valuable if you're trying to figure out, well, what do you do about homelessness as an example? Or, you know, or how do we get better arts and culture? And so you, you start to you know, create um, problem solving groups that can help work on those kinds of things. And some of those ideas might actually turn into intellectual property that would ultimately turn into businesses. So this whole idea of libraries as community knowledge managers, which is a term as far as I know is that I'm the only one that uses it, um, the idea of trying to harness the knowledge that and the intellectual capital of the community to solve community problems, whether they're public problems or, or things that can be turned into uh, you know, private um, uh, businesses of some type and create jobs and, and, um, and um, um, new uh, income for the community is something that's, that's greatly interesting to me and it would be interesting to start seeing if libraries could be a place to do that. So that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about in creating this connectivity and then also of course they've, libraries have always diffused information but the idea of being able to diffuse innovation is a new twist on that. And then uh, kind of the last thing on my little bullet list there is we're already using um, the libraries to do data analytics for us and in one sense we're using their demographics databases to do um, you know things like drive time analysis for our businesses so they can see if there's um, you know what their market area would be and how many people and the demographics of that etc. So um, so you know we we in one of the things that we started doing with the libraries when we interact is they started asking us well what databases would you like to have? Well well that was wonderful because for us, there's some things that we use 
not all the time, so it's hard for us to justify it, but if we could team up with a library and get them to do it, then we have the access to it and some of our clients, and, um, who have, and we can help show them how to use it, and at the same time, they can access it for free or maybe some low-cost uh, charge, whereas you know, if they bought it themselves, it might be thousands of dollars. So there's, there's this role here that, again, that libraries play that's really important and generally sort of unrecognized. So next slide. So another thing, just traditional economic development, you know, we, we're involved in location searches. So people come to us saying, well, we're looking at four or five different locations. We're trying to pick the best place. And, you know, you're one of them. And so help us to make the case. So libraries can help us with that. That's, um, in a way, almost too obvious. But another thing, and we're actually working on this now with our library, just at the very beginning of it is, is doing community benchmarking. So we want to improve as a community and we want to compare ourselves to other counties. We know there's a lot of data out there, but it takes time to gather it and you have to go through a learning curve. So it's like, well, why not go to our libraries and have them help us, you know, gather the data and show us what is out there in the universe for benchmarking ourselves against other communities and let them be kind of our research arm. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're, or as we grow our relationship beyond things like just helping small businesses, it's starting to morph into. And of course, things like trend analysis and, um, and kind of creating uh, a sense of where the community is going as, as well as the country is something that I think that libraries do really well because they're up on usually on what is going on around the world because they get asked so many questions from people. So, and a lot of libraries, just by personality, I found to be quite visionary and interested in new ideas. So they're a logical um, place to, to uh, engage if you're thinking about the future and how you build better communities. And of course, the whole idea of connecting people, we've, uh, we've kind of already gone over that. But then finally, I think they're the, the missing link in our education system. And of course, that was, the, from my um, understanding, was kind of the start of libraries because now we have a formal education system, but we know that the world is, a, as I mentioned before, is a VUCA world. It's constantly changing. And so where do you go for lifelong learning? Well, you can go back to a community college or something, and you can pay somebody some money. But the best solution in some respects is you know, what might be called autodidacticism, where people just become lifelong learners, and they go to the library, and they engage with other people and other resources, and they and they just learn it themselves. And in, if you think about it, it's a very efficient way to do it. You know, rather than signing up for class and going through some formal uh, learning process, to just be able to get online or go get a book on something and learn it, and then you're done with it. You can move on to the next thing. Is really powerful. And uh, and so if we can harness libraries to do that, that will help our entrepreneurs. In my case, to uh, to be self-educated and to be constantly growing, not to mention the workforce. So next next slide. So you know, just to kind of wrap up, so how do we sort of build that system? Well, you know, we you have to kind of start at least how we found is, um, you know, is like, is you got to start with what you have. So. And that's kind of what we're doing. And so and that's how we discover the libraries. We go, You've got libraries, how can we engage them, right? So, and then I think the other thing is to partner up with people who have a, a similar vision so that you can collaborate uh, together. And then uh, something that might be a little bit uh, unusual is, um, you know, I think we need to look at what might be called the less developed uh, countries of the world because when they're behind, what one of the things that happens is they seem to make they, they innovate and they seem to come up with new ideas that um, we would never have thought of. So my best example of this is um, there's a guy, there's an organization called the Grameen Bank, which started working with, um, I think it was poor women in India and trying to help them get started and, um, and starting businesses. So they realized, well, if they could give them a little bit of money and a loan, that they could actually create businesses and they would get paid back. Eventually, they won a Nobel Prize for that. So now what's happened in our own case and others is that we started a what we call a Pasco microloan program that loans people small amounts of money to start businesses. And 
We've made um, 19 loans so far, and I think we've got one of them that is not current, and that's only recent. So everybody's paying back. They're all starting businesses, etc. And that's an idea that came out of the so-called third world. So I think that you know, if we look at unusual places, there are people doing things that are interesting, and the, and the libraries can kind of help us find those uh, places and those ideas. So then beyond that, I'm not a great believer in doing lots of planning. I have what I call one, two, three plans. First we're going to do this, then we're going to do that, then we're going to do this. So more what I'm into is kind of trying little experiments. So as again, going to the libraries, it might be just interesting to go, let's go try a little mini incubator in a library and just see what happens, see if it works. If it works, then you know maybe we'll put them in 15 branches or something. So that's the kind of uh, way I think that you kind of get started, where you actually just start doing things and see how they work out. Ultimately, you know, we've got to do things like teaching financial literacy and risk taking and ownership as a career alternative. But, ulti but ultimately, we also want to kind of go viral and get other people engaged and get them excited so that they will in turn multiply our efforts. And then that kind of gets the so-called ecosystem started um, that uh, we're trying to create here. And then finally, you know, you need, we need to be able to celebrate successes and failures because if you look at somebody like Thomas Edison, you know, it took him a thousand tries to invent the light bulb. Well, you know, what if he'd given up after 999? So uh, it would be a very strange world today. So it just it seems like celebrating failure and successes and putting it into that concept of, well, we're relentlessly moving forward is what we want to do. And the libraries can, again, play a role in helping build the system. So next slide. Okay, and there's my contact information. And if you have any questions or comments, I, I'd be glad to uh, uh, hear them. I will just tell you, um, you might wonder, well, the incubators that we have, um, you know, so what, what have they done? Are they really working? Well, we, we actually created about 90 jobs so far. And um, we've got maybe 20 companies in there and uh, between a couple of them. Um, so, you know, it's starting to work. We have saw the numbers of the Pasco Enterprise Network. And a lot of these companies are just, you know, they're not like an Apple computer. They might be somebody that is just starting a simple company that helps people design web pages or sales insurance. Or uh, we had a guy that started a law office. It's just all kinds of stuff. And we don't worry too much about what they're trying to do. The main thing is to get people to act on this idea that I want to become an owner and an entrepreneur. And we think they'll find the markets. And, um, you know, and they'll find something they're passionate about. And if it doesn't work out, they'll exit it and they'll find something else. And this is, again, why the library is so important because maybe it didn't work out the first time. You go back to your librarian or you go to your economic developer who's collaborating with your librarian. And they go, oh, I'm thinking maybe I should try this. Um, can you guys help me with that? It's like, sure, we'll help you. And so we help them research a different market or a different business, help them get started, and maybe the second or third or fourth time, you know, they hit a home run and ultimately employ 500 or 1,000 people or whatever it might be. So that's kind of what we're doing in Pasco County. It's very exciting, and we're ultimately just getting started. But uh, we have made a little progress. So thank you. So at this point in time, we want to open up the session for um, questions. Uh, anyone who may have those, go ahead and you can either raise your hand or type them into the chat box. So, um, John, it looks like you give, have given a pretty thorough presentation. We don't see any questions at this point in time. Uh, we do have a question. When will the next small business webinars be? Okay. Patrick? Our next small business web webinar will be on the 15th, uh, and, the, and, the, and the one after that will be on the 23rd. And we've pushed those links out so that those are available to you um, in this web webinar chat box, and we also have them on our web page.
so you can visit them there. Um, Nancy wasn't able to join us today, but if you all have the opportunity to see Nancy, Nancy Fredericks at any point in time at library meetings, please feel free to explore a little bit more with her, how they've worked in partnership to be able to, to do this. And John, we appreciate so much that uh, you've taken the time to work with us. And we do have some more questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, one of the questions was, well, how did you get started? Did you get some startup funding? And um, initially, we, we, didn't, we didn't have any startup funding. We just did it. So our, our startup funding was we invited in a group of people who were working with businesses. And we, we said, well, why don't we just start working together and why don't we create this thing, we'll call it the Pasco Enterprise Network, and we'll stick up a web page for it, and we'll, and we just kind of, everybody volunteered to do a little bit, and we just kind of got started that way. And so that, that was kind of organizing what we would call our technical assistance resources, and, and that's sort of how we connected with the library, it was through that process. But it, it really started with an attempt by them to get a grant, which they subsequently got, and we were asked to write a, write a letter of support, and we said, well, what are you doing? And then as we learned they were trying to work with small businesses, we just included them in this group that we were trying to work with. And so I'm not saying it didn't take any money. We just kind of fed it basically with each with our own resources by, by essentially volunteering to do things and getting some things going. And, um, and so, so that's how it got started. But then as we morphed into um, microloans, which really don't have so much to do with the library, but was the second step, um, we went out to um, the county and we took some of our own resources and we went out to our banks and we just asked them to give us money. And they've given us um, almost $400,000 now over the last few years that we have lent out to small small businesses at maybe $25,000 on average at a time. And so that again was it was a it was kind of like making stone soup, you know, we just said well, we're going to create this program and um, and we'll go put, you know, $50,000 into it. And then we went over to the county and said how about if you put in 100? And then we went to, you know, a number of businesses and they put in anywhere from 1,000 to $25,000 and then it just grew. And then we went back around to some of them. Well, then the third thing was we said, you know, we have money and we have um, technical assistance. What if we got a couple of buildings? We'll start with one and we'll try to put people in these spaces. So we got a building owner to make us a real deal on a lease. And then we brought in, when we started to promote it, we brought in these businesses. And then we started looking at doing an incubator actually in a library. But then one of our cities came along and they had an empty building and they liked what we were doing. They said, well, we'll let you use the building and we'll give you some operating money. And so in the end, we collected about a quarter of a million dollars and that was 100,000 from the county, 50,000 from each of two communities, and $50,000 out of the blue from the Florida High Tech Quarter Council, um, basically through the University of South Florida. And so that's been our operating budget, and um, and now we've gone back and gotten you know a couple more sources of that. What's interesting is in Pasco County now we have a penny sales tax, and it generates some money for economic development. So I've been a proponent for how we should use those dollars. I'm not a county employee, and one of the things that I've said is, well, I think we should go create some maker spaces. So we've put in our proposal the county six hundred thousand dollars to go start some maker spaces. And the idea is that one or more of those could end up in a library, you know, depending on the space and the equipment and all that sort of thing. So Nancy's been working on her side to figure out, well, how would that look like? You know, how, would, how could we put that together, et cetera? So we're going down a parallel path here that hopefully will converge with some dollars. And then once, once we do that, then I think that opens up uh, the possibility of using the maker spaces uh, or a maker space as a way of generating uh, some interest in the library as let's call it a mini incubator or whatever. You know, it's again we're experimenting. I know six hundred thousand dollars sounds like a big experiment, but and I'm not sure it'll end up being that much money, but my idea was to create about three of these across Pasco County and at a couple hundred thousand apiece. So that gives you kind of a sense of how it works. It's very much a bootstrap thing, but as people get excited about it, 
you know, they are willing to put more resources into it, and um, and we see it growing. And um, I think we're ultimately just getting started. This is sort of a proof of concept thing. Um, I think another question I saw flash up there was, um, how do you promote it or market? Um, you know, the your help for small businesses, and we we have a a pretty robust marketing program here, and I'll I'll just tell you it has. Uh, four components to it. Um, one is what we might call traditional promotion, where you know we um, take out ads and we do direct mail and um, the kinds of things that you would, you know, brochures, etc. And then we have a big social media um, initiative going on. So we use uh, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And then we also have a um, a specialized website that is called PascoCounty.tv. And it's essentially working off the premise that, and it's an experiment that the um, that the internet and the and television are converging. So we're experimenting with new ways to present things on the web that are not static; they're more video oriented. So we're starting to 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 aggregate video from different sources around the county and putting it up there as a way to show all the good things that are going on in the county. And then the, the fourth thing would be publicity, things like news releases, personal meetings, et cetera. And so our, our, our marketing essentially starts something in one of those channels, and then it amplifies it around the other channels and kind of starts conversations going. That's a, a simple sort of way to put it. And so when we do a lot of this, you know, especially in the startup community where we can use Twitter and Facebook to go you know, push things out there, or we can have a news release we put out, and then we take the news release and push it out a portion of it through um, through our social media, and then maybe it turns into um, you know an email blast, and you know, on and on and on. So it just it kind of never stops. Hope that's helpful, sort of long-winded, but there's quite a bit to it. John, we have a, a question here. Laura asks, "What would you say are the top business resources libraries should be promoting?" Well, I, I, I love the demographics now. We are using that. That is really useful because you can do drive time analysis. And I think any, you know, businesses, especially small ones, they're, they're not really, they don't really fully understand how they can use demographic data because they've always looked at it in the past as sort of the, sort of the traditional, um, you know, well, the population of the county or some, or the number of households or something like that. They don't understand how you can tailor it and how you can get into um, psychographics to really define who your market is and where other markets are that you could access that resemble where your current customers are coming from or what those current customers look like. So I think some of these um, databases that you know, we, we, we use things like Claritas as an example, but, you know, you got to pay money for that. And the demographics now, we've been, we've been, we actually built a brochure for, um, for the city of Zephyr Hills using some of that data. And it was really cool what we were able to do because they were trying to use it to attract retail. So we did an analysis in the trade area of how much was being spent for certain retail items. And then we did a second cut that showed how much was being sold of those items within the city of Zephyr Hills and showed that there was a retail gap. So as an example, I'm just making this up, but you know maybe there was a, a, a $20 million market for lawn and garden supplies in the, in the trade area, like a drive time of, let's say, is uh, you know, 15 minutes. But then in the actual city, there was maybe only five million dollars being sold by retail merchants uh, selling in the lawn and garden um, markets. So it's it's like wow, there's a fifteen million dollar gap there that somebody could locate a lawn and garden store and would have a very reasonable chance of um, being successful because that because people are driving out of the community to go buy their lawn and garden supplies. So this is just. Uh, you know, really good stuff for people trying to figure out when they're starting a business where there's actually a market for their business. And um, so I particularly like that. But, I mean, 
the list is sort of endless. Thanks, John. I think um, we don't have any more questions that have come in right this second, but we're going to stay on and make sure that we get all the questions answered. So keep them coming if you guys have more questions or comments. Um, please type them into chat or raise your hand and we'll make sure those get answered. We'll stay on as long as we need to to make sure we get everybody's questions answered. But um, we know that it's, it's getting fairly close to 11, so some of you have places to be. We're glad that you're on with us. And thank you again, John, uh, for the amazing information. Um, you know, another thing I'm, that I want to just mention that we're trying to do, and I, I think that, um, again, the libraries could be great here in terms of diffusing or, um, uh, information, is that a lot of the companies we work with, um, they have problems and, we, um, and challenges, and we're trying to solve them, and they typically are expressed in tactical ways. So as an example, it's like, well, you know, I, I, I'm starting this company, but I don't really understand uh, finance very well. So, you know, we'll say, oh, well, we'll set up a workshop, or you can get this book, and you can read about finances, or we'll teach you QuickBooks, or whatever. And the problem is that most businesses don't really think um, strategically, even ones that have been in business for a long time. So we've actually started working with a consultant who's, um, that's kind of his specialty, and he's developed a, a system to, um, to help businesses on strategy. And uh, it's really been an eye-opener for us. And so I think one of our things that we're trying to do here is we're going to develop that as a system to use here in Pasco County and teach as many of our businesses as we can this whole different thought process. And as we get into that, you know, we may be trying to get the libraries to help us to uh, get the word out that there's this different way of thinking and that would really be helpful for your business and you ought to sort of learn this. And it's a, it's a whole other topic, and I won't get into it, but I think the idea of trying to create a, 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 a kind of a system where people understand where they are in their business development, this is, this is typically the problem, and then what you need to pay attention to at, at that particular stage in your business development. And, um, um, and then once you learn that and you move to another stage, and these are sort of definable um, from an academic standpoint, then you pay attention to different things. And so it, it kind of takes the noise out of your life as a business person and gets you to focus on the things that are really important. Well, again, libraries can be a place where we could get that um, thought process out there through seminars and other forms of you know, information dissemination. Um, and, and not only that, we can also help to maybe organize court coaches through the library to help people sort of understand this process um, just by pulling community people into it who have expertise. So that's kind of uh, our kind of our next thought process. I'd like to uh, uh, remind everybody that there is a, uh, a demonstration of how to use demographics now on April 23rd at noon. It's the Florida Libraries and Small Business Incubators using Gale FEL Resources Part 2. That's April 23rd at noon. And I'd also like to encourage you to complete our survey that will be sent to you after this webinar. We value your feedback. I encourage you to uh, complete that. Thank you very much for attending. All right. Um, it's, it appears that we have don't have any more questions in the chat box, and I don't see any hands raised at this point in time. So we'll go ahead and bring closure to the webinar. Once again, John, thank you so much for the amount of time you put into working with us to um, roll out this webinar. And uh, hopefully that folks who have other questions will contact you or Nancy in the future to get more information um, or get specifics that will help them implement this and move it further in their library. So thank you so much, John, for your time and for folks who joined us today. Yep, my, my pleasure, and I think any, anybody that's got any questions, um, feel free to call us. We, we love to share everything we're doing. It's, it's a, you know, a validator for us, but, but also it's, um, you know, we want other communities to, to grow and take advantage of anything that they can. And, 
Um, you know, we kind of have a saying, larceny is the sincerest form of flattery. So if whatever you want to steal from us, have at it. We love that. Great. Thanks, John. And thanks to everybody for being on with us today. And hopefully we'll see you on um, later this month for the, um, the Gale webinars.